see our, our products pop up at its stores that I go to is always really cool. Every time I go to like Sprouts or Whole Foods, if I'm with my mom, for example, I'm like, that's us, that's us. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive an ROI from their investments of CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Femi Olesupo, who's the director of CX for Truvani, which is a really innovative, high growth company in the um, health supplements um, and, and, and personal care space. Uh, thanks for joining, Femi. Thank you for having me. So I guess to get us started, um, you know, Truvani is a, um, uh, a, a, a more of a mission-driven brand, I would say, and a high-growth emerging brand in the wellness and fitness categories. Um, how do you think about CX in this category, you know, given the emotional connection and the purpose that the category has and that your brand has within this space? Yeah, um, it's so interesting. When I first started handling customer service at Truvani, I had no anticipation of the kind of questions that people might ask us or the things that they might reveal about their health journeys and such um, in customer service. So it's been a, an incredible learning experience, but um, we just do our very best to like stockpile answers, like anything and everything that a person can ask about a food product comes through our inbox, comes through um, uh, social media channels. And so we just try our very best to keep researching things, keep asking product development for different um, answers to questions and making sure that we save all of those because they are about to come up again. Um, so it's really about just uh, making sure that we get the best information about um, our clean ingredients, our testing process, everything to um, our customers, and then also taking their needs seriously. A lot of people have different ailments out there, different journeys that they've been on, and they really want to have a product that they can trust. And so we love explaining to people why uh, free body is a product that you can trust. And a lot of times it just comes down to look at the ingredients on the back of our packaging versus the back of another uh, similar product. Ours are all pronounceable ingredients. They're real food ingredients. And so that is uh, really uh, one of the, the best things that we can say to explain uh, why Trivani is the superior choice. Where, where do the conversations with your customers take place mostly, you know, between call center, chat, um, social media? Where's the conversation happening? So a lot in the inbox, of course, and then a whole lot on social media. So DMs, um, comments on posts, com comments on ads. I would say that is the grand majority. Um, and then we also have text messaging that's possible um, to communicate with customers through that, which is awesome because that's really convenient for customers. Um, and then, of course, the call center. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else, but that's those are the main ones. So you talked a moment ago about like the frequently asked questions and how to make sure that the people engaging with the customer have the right expertise to deliver answers in an authentic way for the brand. Um, and that's useful and meaningful to the customers. How do you develop those insights for what to what? And, and then how do you train and develop that expertise in your people to be able to field those questions? Yeah. Well, the first thing is that we are all consumers of our <laughs> of the product that we're helping to facilitate. So Toronto is really generous in giving us a little bit of a stipend every month to get products. A lot of us love the products. Uh, I know I have shelves with shelves of the true body at home. Um, so we taste the product. We like the products. We all have our different favorites of, you know, the bars or the protein powder, the collagen, whatever. And so we can give a personal take on, hey, this is how I make my smoothies with this product. This is how I eat my bars. Or oh, have you ever thought of adding collagen to mashed potatoes if you want to get more collagen in it? Like that's not a, a thing that people might come up with on their own. So it's great for us and the whole team to be able to share those kinds of experiences. But then, uh, like I mentioned, we get all sorts of questions and things we would never know the answer to. So we keep a, a stockpile of like spreadsheets and such with different questions per product. 
Um, and then we work really closely with the product development team, ask them questions. We work with the owners, ask them questions. And every time we give an answer, we do try to save that or make a canned response out of it. So the next time somebody asks that question, we can give them uh, the proper answer. What you're highlighting is that effectively you're running lots of natural experiments because your people are constantly interacting with customers and learning what they're asking about, what's working, what's resonating. And, and, but how do you figure out and share that insight to kind of spread what's working across the team more effectively? How much is formal versus informal where people just do it organically because they like to collaborate and share with each other? Yeah, so when someone is uh, hired during the onboarding process, we do give a full orientation of all the products because, of course, they wouldn't have the the knowledge or the taste yet. Um, We have our spreadsheets as well. We have different ways we train on, hey, here are the keywords that you might find are really useful to search our Slack channels, search our our Google Docs, for example. And uh, yeah, we we that would be the most formalized process where we have different sheets for different products. Um, and then after they uh, are onboarded and they get their first package of all of our products, they get to try it, get to see what they like. And then that's an ongoing, more organic, natural way of, of sharing. And then we also have um, a channel in our, our Slack where it's called customer feedback. So that one started off, um, you know, we would have maybe three, four, five different protein powder flavors. But customers would naturally be like, hey, have you ever thought of this flavor? Have you ever thought of that flavor? So we just started sharing all of those things. Um, And the team sometimes already have plans to make that or we can pull from that to to know what customers want. You know, I find this uh, really fascinating how this has evolved in the marketing, sales and services space where, you know, we're able to mine the calls and mine the social media or the Slack or the email to generate insights. And you're able to drive continuous improvement and train people on it or optimize content on it. How has your game evolved in the way you kind of mine insights and, and, and develop content and the, and the kind of either the frequency or quality of what you're doing based on mining these sources? Well, our customers are really vocal, so they will always let us know if, if something we're doing isn't working. We definitely pay attention to a lot of that. Um, I always tell the team, like, if somebody has complained about something, like, if you've seen it twice and you're the one, that one rep out of 16, um, you know, other people are about to see that as well. And so that's something that we want to pass on or put into, um, you know, the channel with suggestions and whatnot. Uh, so I think it's just really paying attention and then training the team. Like if you are on this channel, text messaging, and you see something frequently happening, like this coupon code isn't working or these, um, this order is not going out, then that's something you need to pass up. And then we check it out further and then see if there is a process that's broken or uh, a change that needs to be made so that we can make a better customer experience. So part of what you're delivering here is an amazing product experience, but you're also, and you're generating constant feedback to improve the product um, or launch new products or how to market the product, but you're also Part of your brand, it sounds like, is delivering an experience that goes beyond the product because the way they interact with the expertise of your people or the content you're providing or the community you're building around the product is actually part of the brand. It's part of the experience. And love to get your thoughts on how you actually think about like what the brand stands for and how much of those these experiential elements are part of the brand, too. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting working at Trevani, even seeing on an individual basis how my perspective on food has changed because I just didn't know before, you know, and then the conversation is always around our clean ingredients, the quality of our products, looking at the labels. And so, or even um, Vani Hari is one of our um, owners, you know, she's the food babe learning, you know, if she puts out a, an article or something and you're like, oh, I had no idea about this. And so that's changed my refrigerator and what it looks like uh, before Trivani and then after Trivani. So times that by everyone on the team, whoever we're talking to and interacting with, I think there is a strong educational um, aspect of just 
our experience of Trubani and then sharing that experience with others. And then seeing how customers write into us as well and tell us how Trubani has helped enhance their fitness journeys, their um, you know, sickness journeys, just what, their health journeys in general. Um, and then on top of that, Trubani is a beautiful brand. You know, looking at our packaging, um, we recently launched some uh, like apparel type things. And then we have um, like small gifts, like a, a container or of our tote bags that everyone loves. And so it's, oh, and we also, that spurred even a, um, a Slack channel internally of all Trubani in the wild. When we see like someone at the store and they saw somebody with a Trubani uh, tote bag, or just now that we're kind of exploding in retail, seeing what the shelves look at, look like in different parts of the country. Um, so I think there's a huge educational aspect to just, being a part of this brand and sharing it with people, listening to customers as well. And then there's a, a fun element of it's kind of a lifestyle, um, you know, with the different apparel and stuff. And then also how that bleeds out into, oh, I'm going to check the ingredients on these other products that are non trubani products and see, you know, what's what's in that. It's really fun that you're in this emerging brand space. Um you know, having worked a lot in my career with a lot of larger brands when I was, you know, at Booz and Company and then PwC, big consulting firms, they tend to work with the bigger companies, right? But then I really enjoyed since launching my own business a year ago, Journey Spark, working with uh, emerging brands and, and companies that are more, you know, shaping and redefining categories, whereas the bigger guys used to buy them. And we've actually seen the data that all the growth in a lot of categories is actually driven by the emerging brand. So that must be a lot of fun to be in that really vibrant, exciting space. Definitely. Popping up, seeing our, our products pop up at stores that I go to is always really cool. Every time I go to like Sprouts or Whole Foods, if I'm with my mom, for example, I'm like, that's us. That's us. <laughs> so, you can personally yeah. see the impact you're having on the brand's growth and people's lives using the product. That must be really fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that um, I, you know, Femi, um, like to think of, I'd share something in my book, the CX and culture connection. I introduced a concept that I've used with clients called the experience collage. And I think of my mom's a collage artist. You can see over my shoulder, one of her paintings. That's a, um, a collage artwork uh, called emotion motion. And it's a, a series. And, uh, the experience collage is basically this idea that your customer journey is a set of experiences that all fit together. And the way they all fit together creates deeper meaning. And you can actually think of the experience as filling a canvas. And you want to fill the whole canvas in your experience collage with pieces into, into four quadrants. So you can't get the consultant out of me. I still use a two by two. Um, but the, uh, the canvas, um, as you can see on the, on the screen is a, a two by two where the bottom left is a functional experience. The top left is a shared experience. The bottom right is meaning. And the top right is community, right? And so you want to get all four of those, you know, a functional experience, which is like your product usage, your website, your mobile app. That has to be good. You don't want friction. You want ease of doing business. But functional experience is not enough to create an awesome brand. You want sharing, which is an experience that goes beyond the individual. You share with others. Um, and you want meaning tapping what that's part of what you do with your brand is you tap into deeper meaning in the category and people's lives beyond the product itself. And then what's really cool is you create community around the brand. You, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts around like, what are you doing to create balance across all four of these? And how has your approach evolved to really get to that true community around the brand? Well, a lot of that is sort of, uh, beyond what I do in Trivani, but I think that um, our leaders do a really good job of um, just getting the face of Trivani out there. Um, they have a lot of gifting campaigns, um, you know, reaching out to different influencers, and we're willing to, um, I know there's like costs involved with this, but there's a lot of sampling that we do of our products um, so that people can try it. And if they genuinely like it, then they can purchase it again. Um, and we're really confident in what we have. Uh, so we're willing to to do that. And then Trivani definitely participates in a number of different events, you know, uh, might collaborate with 
a gym or um, like a wellness event or something um, to get the product into more people's hands, but also so that they can experience like other people being really excited. I know when I've done uh, trade shows, it's been really, it's been in- interesting seeing from the first trade show that I ever participated in several years ago to now. Um, I remember I spoke so much at those trade shows explaining to people what Trivani is, why it's a great product. To fast forward every year, it's like we're speaking less and less because people run up to us and be like, I know Trivani, I've tried this flavor, I've tried that flavor. You know, oh, but we have more flavors, they want to try that too. So it's been really cool to see how Trivani kind of, it like took on a life of its own. So I feel like, yes, we do a lot to to create community in, in that sense and, and brand awareness also, but like, it's taken off on its own. Other people uh, do a lot of sharing and posting and there's a lot of user generated uh, content. So I feel like the community kind of is taking care of itself. You definitely shared a lot of examples of how the company overall plays across the whole uh, canvas. Um, but you know, earlier in the podcast, you talked about the role of social media and conversations where your team's part of the conversation. So I, I definitely sounds like you're contributing in a, in a really important way to fostering conversations that deepen meaning and sharing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, with, it, with my team of customer service, uh, yeah, our job is to constantly be in conversation with customers. I think one part of that is, of course, solving problems for customers, making sure that they get what they pay for and in a, a great way that they have an experience. They walk away from the experience of purchasing from us with a smile. But then the other hand of it is that these are not just customers. They're individual people. They're human beings. They have lives. They've got all of these things going on, and it's okay to meet them there. Um, I definitely encourage uh, my team to have conversations with with customers like if a customer says that they're going through a really hard time don't just ignore that you know you can ask questions you especially if it's on the phone or via text message uh you know we're not going to get into people's personal lives but um people share a lot (laughs) more than you would think they do in customer service and so we want to uh kind of surprise and delight them that's part of our customer service culture um and telling people like, hey, you're going through a hard time. Let me throw in a little bit of extra thing for you to make you smile. Do you have specific um, types of attributes to the experience or emotions that you want people to feel that you look for in a good call or a good conversation? Yeah, I want people to feel helped. Uh, I want them to feel heard and understood, which is not the same of, you know, I've got your your problem, here is a solution. It's uh, reading a little bit between the lines and intuiting what um, the customer really is trying to say. And, and then I also, I just want people to feel happy. I want them to, uh, if, if we can't provide them the smoothest um, experience, because sometimes there are just things that we can't control. I want the customer to walk away feeling like, oh, well, that didn't turn out badly like I thought it was going. They were able to turn it around. I always tell the team, our job is to turn frowns upside down. So when you're reviewing calls or listening in or coaching people, are you looking for like three to five things that you want to see consistently show up or that you can train people on? I would say the things I want to see is that they are reading or hearing the the customer's inquiry in full. So don't answer two out of three things. Answer three out of three things if that's what the customer brought out. I want to see that the the customer service representative has done a good job of being kind of resourceful. Um, You know, we can't do this for you. We can do this for you. How's that? I want to make sure that the customer service representative is um, following through with what they said that they were going to do. So that's a little bit more than just that one conversation. Like if there's anything pending, it is your responsibility to follow through um, and contact that person and tell them again, I'm looking for the customer service representative to be um, positive, friendly, professional uh, representative um, of the company. Um, Yeah. How do you build habits in those areas? If you notice somebody is, needs improvement on one of those areas, how do you give them the feedback and get them to be committed and 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 focusing on like building those habits in an area where they can improve? Because we can all improve, and it's good to get feedback. Definitely, 
Um, so in the beginning, when someone's brought on, we I try to do the best job possible of making sure the criteria for success is very clear and they know exactly what it is. And then after a certain while, let's say 30, 60 days, uh, when we are spot checking different um, calls or texts or emails with people, we if we see something that's worth improving, if it's something that we see across the board, it's something that I might bring up. I usually have like a weekly email um, or I might put it in Slack or both and, and explain why this is not the best way to handle it. And here's some suggestions for um, the next time. I also like to make visuals. I think people have different learning styles. So I might go into Canva and make, you know, like um, some kind of infographic for people so they can save it in their records. Um, so that's one way. And then on an individual basis, uh, if it's something I see one person doing, I'll bring their tickets up to them specifically and say, hey, you know, what could you have done better here? And let them tell me what it is. And if it's not a great answer, you know, I might have to do a little bit of extra coaching on that. But um, yeah, those are the main ways we do that. Those are great. That's fantastic that you have all these ways of driving continuous improvement and sharing and really activating the right behaviors with your people and having them help each other too, not just you monitoring or coaching them. Um, for the audience, I'd encourage you to to like and subscribe. And, you know, you could also go back and look at, uh, for example, if we're talking about habit building um, you know, uh, look at the episode with Joseph Michelli, uh, which really he, he does a lot of work with uh, Starbucks and with Carlton and Zappos and other great brands that have built employee experiences and, and talks about that in our episode. And also with um, um, uh, Chris Taylor from Actionable, we talk about habit building and behavior. So those would be two episodes to check out. Um and also, you could check out the CX and Culture Connection book, uh, which ha is all about um, how do you drive this connect nexus of behavior in the organization of your people to drive a great customer experience. A lot of what Femi and I are talking about is how do you not just get the right skills and right mindsets of hiring the right people, but reinforcing the right behaviors of your people over time. I can add one more thing. It's just that I really feel like the leader of the, the team, any department, it, it's on. It's their responsibility to create the culture for that department. There's a, a culture for the entire team, uh, the entire company, but there's also a culture on your individual department. And so with my department, I really try and have a compassionate culture where there's flexibility, where people feel like humans. All the ways that I want my team to treat our customers, I create an environment where they're treated that way as well. And I feel like there's a real ripple effect uh, when they love coming to work, when it's fun for them, um, you know, when they're they're excited about other things because customer service can be a little monotonous. It can be a little bit draining because people forget that we are also human beings sometimes. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, people can be a little bit angry, um, you know, when they try and get what they want. And that's just the nature of customer service. That's never going to change. But I never want my people to feel like uh, they are, they don't have someone who has their back. Um, you know, it's kind of hard if you think about it, if someone's going through a really rough time. And when you, the bigger the team is that you have, the more instances of people going through personal hardships there are. And so I really um, try to create a culture where people don't have to hide that they're going through a hard time. And there's like a flexibility even in the criteria for success. Um, and so when they feel like they are being shown kindness, I feel like they go and do their job with a little bit extra kindness as well. I love the fact that you're talking about behavior in culture. You know, uh, culture, to geek out for just a second, uh, culture has four key building blocks. Your mindsets skills, relationships, and behaviors. And energy flows in a company because of the relationships people have. Like social media is basically things flowing because of relationships. The same thing's true inside a company. And energy will flow. And if people don't have the right mindsets, they bottle that up, right? But ultimately, it's the behaviors that really spread things, that drive things. And if you don't have the right behavior, nothing, change doesn't occur. And you don't get effectiveness. So it's fantastic that you're focusing on behavior there. 
I, I, it's the most important of the four to actually drive a, a the right culture um, to get real change to occur in a culture. Um, I'd love to learn more about like what do you think of as the behaviors or the the kind of what makes the culture at Truvani, um, you know, unique or different. Like what are what what are the aspects of the traits of the culture, if you will, that make it what it is. Yeah, so we're a completely remote team, um, and at least in my department, uh, in order to build relationships, I try to do a lot of, I call them weekly one-on-ones. It's like every week I might send an inspirational video sort of reinforcing the kind of behaviors and mindsets that I want to see with my people, Um, and then we have some sort of question around it or a challenge around it, uh, for example. And, you know, everyone needs to point out one customer that was really difficult that they thought they weren't going to be able to change, uh, you know, turn the ground upside down and that they were able to do that. And so, like, post your example of that from the week in the uh, in the our team chat, things like that. Or um, sometimes we do games as well. Again, customer service can be very monotonous. It can be a little bit draining if we're, you know, having a hard, a high volume of tickets and, you know, people might be angry about one thing or another. So oh, I've done things where it's like, hey, we're all going to have like a little scavenger hunt or we're going to play charades, you know, digitally. We're going to have pictures of our work from home, um, office space. You know, something to break up the monotony and get them really excited about at least that one aspect of their day. So imagine we're, raising the energy of the team. And then that's the energy they're going and talking to customers with. And then I always try and incorporate prizes too for participation because I also say showing up is 80% of, of winning the day. And so uh, I want to reinforce that sort of um, attitude with my people too. And so the people that show up the most get points and then uh, they might get a well, they typically get a gift card, and even that I want to break up too. So there was a, a survey I did just with the team like years ago because I also have a lot of retention on my team. And, uh, you know, by then everyone's forgotten about that survey. But on that survey, I've, um, I've asked questions like, what's your favorite local restaurant? You know, what um, you know places do you like? What foods do you like? All that kind of stuff. And so imagine two years later, we're doing this sort of show up game and it's breaking up the monotony of the day. Everyone's really pumped. And at the end, the people that participated the most get a gift certificate to not a chain restaurant, a specific local restaurant in their day or in their neighborhood or whatever. Uh, I feel like that makes them feel seen, heard, and valued. So then how do you think we're going to treat the people that we interact with, no matter how difficult they might be? So that kind of ways that I personally on my team. I love the way you're the way you're humanizing it, the way you're making it feel relevant to them. You're showing that they're appreciated and heard. It's not cookie cutter. It's awesome. Um, yeah, and, um, and and the fact that you're using storytelling and gamification and fun, like it's not just uh, customer or employee listening and surveys. Like that, that, those are useful, but that's kind of dry and not doesn't drive energy. There are means to an end. Exactly. Yes, I think the more personal it can be, it's communicating. I see you as a person. I value you as a person. Your presence on my team is not like you're just a number that's replaceable tomorrow. Uh, and I want that sort of, I want them to feel pride in being a customer service representative so they can go and do a job that they feel proud about as well. It might make it personal for me, if you allow me. My dad was an um, accountant who then got into other areas and actually got very passionate about education and about how to improve education. So his like career after retiring as a partner was to create a business wisdom dynamics to work on education. And what he really believed in, and it rubbed off on me, is like, you want to give back, you want to, you want to help others, you know, um, what really connected for me when from his work, my dad's work was this idea about intrinsic motivation, that people want to do well. They want, to, and in in um, in psychology, people talk about four drives, and I write about this in my book, the CX and Culture Connection. That there's a drives to acquire, defend, bond, and learn. Mm-hmm. And I, I I've co-authored articles on this, but basically, we focus a lot of energy on the drive to acquire and defend, mm-hmm. and not enough on the drives to bond and learn. 
The it drive is. requires like economics, like self gain. And it, you know, you can study that and about how people want to improve their economic self interests, mm. but we're human beings. Exactly. And a lot of things that we do are because we're bonding and learning with others, not because we're trying to acquire wealth or status. Right. We, we do that, but actually the drive to bond and learn are equally powerful. And a lot of really successful companies that build strong brands and community actually focus on the drives to bond and learn as much or more than the drives to acquire and defend. Even if they don't think of it in those terms, that's what they're yeah. doing. They're tapping into these other human drives. Yeah, I wouldn't have articulated it like that because I should know that before, but I love the way that that, um, that is. I think that it's absolutely correct. Um, and also, I, I, I love the idea that people want to do a good job because they want to do a good job. Just They want to have this job because they actually love coming to work. Or love That's what we it. mean by engagement. Yeah, exactly. Not just because they need it you know, to pay their bills. Obviously that is the way it is for all of us, but there's got to be something more there too. And I think that that's a big reason why we, uh, we tend to have a lot of really great retention at Trivani, especially in the customer service department. A, a lot of, um, you know, um, effort in employee experience is focused on like hire to retire moments that matter in the employee journey. And those are important, like onboarding and, promotion or moment time of need to deal with a personal issue, like how companies show up in those moments affects their culture and are critically important. But that's a very human resources lens to it employee experience. Sometimes, you know, like once a year yeah. or something like that. What we're talking about is complementary to that. It's not the same thing. It draws on some of the same principles. <laughs> about humanizing it and understanding people and connecting with them and tapping into their emotion and being authentic and, and so forth. Um, all the behaviors you talked about in your culture, but it, we're, what we're talking about is the, how the employees show up with customers and, and those happen every day. And those experiences actually create meaning for the customer and the employee um, that it, it actually makes it intrinsically motivating to work somewhere that values that and helps you do that. Pe that you get higher employee retention, not because you designed a better hire to retire experience, but because they enjoy their job. And they enjoy the relationships, uh, you know, the bar that they've got there, the learning, like you mentioned before. Um, yeah, there's so much enrichment that can happen uh, in a workplace environment that, I mean, adults might not be getting in other areas of their life. And we spend so much time at work. If you're working 40 hours a week, that's a lot of your your time in an environment. And if that environment feels draining, if you're not learning anything, I just feel like you're a little, maybe, sorry if my language is harsh, but like you're rotting a little bit inside, you know, and then that ripples out into the other areas of your life without you maybe realizing but if you come to work and you're spending like a third of your life in an environment that feels enriching um you're learning there's things that surprise and delight you um then you can go out and share that experience in other areas of your life and without realizing it too it's making you feel better about yourself and better about your life in other areas so i really enjoyed talking about how you've contributed and been part of a company that's got this really cool product market fit that's the thing we talk about with an emerging brand that you want to get to hyper growth right and you're experiencing that growth and you you've got this product market fit what's the role of cx then to help you scale the business now that you've got the product market fit how does cx help you get that hyperscale, help that hyper growth? So I will uh, admit that we're still in a learning process of that as well. There's been a lot of times in the last year or so where we just really underestimated how much people wanted the product or how, you know, passionately they were about a new flavor. And so we caught ourselves a little off guard in some of our processes that needed to be updated. And we were just inundated in every single channel with customer service. And so one of the ways that I'm working with the team to improve is just making sure that we have coverage everywhere all the time, no matter if it's a low volume time period or a high volume time period. And then having certain protocols because there are times when we, you know, might forget uh, something. We don't want things to fall through the cracks. And so 
Um, you know, if it's like we get over a certain amount of tickets in the inbox, certain channels might need to be turned off or redirected towards another channel. Um, making sure that we update immediately the canned responses if we realize that, um, you know, one or two questions keep coming in, keep coming in, keep coming in, making sure that we alert, um, heads of other departments that might need to send out an email about an update on something. We might need to put something in the subscription portal. Um, just making sure that there are lines of communication and lines of pro- like creative problem solving between the departments to make sure that we are prioritizing, you know, Things that need to happen on the back end to get the, the product to the customers, but also the customer experience that they're having, whether it's a normal time or not. I'm going to break this down and add on if it's okay for the audience, because <clears throat> it's a really important point here, which is often bigger companies like have grown and then they build up bad habits, build up bad practices, and then they have to go back and fix problems or fix root causes. And an emerging high growth company you know, it often, you know, is before a lot of these things have been built up or the the problems start occurring as they scale, right? And it's actually better to address it earlier and deal with it like you're describing by prioritizing rather than just playing a game of whack-a-mole, prioritizing these are the things that are impacting our scalability and fixing them as you, you know, before you hyperscale or as you're scaling and not letting all the, 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 the bad things kind of ossify on the business. Don't let them set in before you get big and then go back and spend a ton of money later to fix it. Fix it up front when you're scaling. That's much better. And the really successful companies figure out how to scale without all the problems rather than letting the problems get entrenched. So what are some of the areas you think that are most important? Is it is it being able to deal with a volume of queries more efficiently? Is it being able to train more people more quickly? Like what what is it that you think are the problems worth solving, those priorities that are most important to address to get scaling right? Uh, definitely um, being able to communicate to customers if there's a change in something that we didn't expect. And, you know, now there's a, you know, back order issue or something like that, being able to effectively and quickly communicate that to them. Um, yeah, I think I think we do a great job of, of training people uh, quickly, but uh, making sure the team is on the same page for all of the channels. So we're in united front, you know, hey, this is an update, this change. Because that's the other thing is like, um, yeah, as the company grows, there's just a lot of things that can pop up that we didn't anticipate there could be you know a spike in in growth in in one in one area something like that that um just has a lot of components that we didn't think of and then if there's any ways that we can make systems better so it's identifying problems quickly and then getting it to the right person or people that need to figure out a solution and making sure that we deploy that solution making sure that the customer service team until that solution is implemented as some sort of workaround that we can offer to customers and making sure that for me also with our customer service team, it's making sure that they feel okay during the high volume time because different people handle stress differently is what I've observed in my team. And um, some people get really panicky and then they might start being short with customers and things like that. So making sure that everyone, I try to make sure that everyone understands that you're not in trouble because there's a high volume of tickets. You know, I know that you're stressed out. I see that you're stressed out, like provide different ways that they can sort of like walk them off the ledge so that we are not compromising quick, like quality for quickness. I want there to also be quality and we can get through the tickets as, as fast as we can, but we can't sacrifice the quality. And um, yeah, and people just need to know that it's okay. Uh, for them to feel a little bit stressed out, you know, at certain time periods, but it's okay. We're it's when we're going to work together. We're going to always say, how do we eat an elephant one bite at a time? So please just one foot in front of the other, breathe, take breaks, all that kind of stuff. Every journey has many steps. Yeah. You got to take one step at a time. Um, do you have any advice for other CX leaders looking to build a CX capability at an emerging brand as opposed to a bigger company? Yeah, um, kind of like what you mentioned before, look out for the, the problems that might come up because they 
likely will. And it's not a real problem. It's a learning opportunity. It's a, an opportunity to figure out like what, how your processes can be better. So that would be one. Um, and then two is just like really pay attention to your team. I feel like I'm a big advocate for compassionate leadership. I actually did I had the opportunity to do a TEDx talk on that recently. And, and so I love giving flexibility to my team. I love getting to know who they are as a person and being able to sort of reinforce aspects of the culture with them on an individual and team type of uh, basis. Um, you know, not just looking for where the problems are in their answers with customers, but like praising just as much when they did a great job, when they brought a solution to the table. You know, we've had people who've been out for all kinds of reasons. Um, I don't even know if I should get into them, miscarriages, bicycle accidents, you know, but we're lucky enough that we get to work from home. But that doesn't mean that, you know, people, I don't want anyone on my team to ever have something really hard going on in their personal life and feel like they're job might be in jeopardy. And so I always try to reinforce reinforce them. Like, you don't have to tell me all the details of everything, but you do need to tell me if something's going on so that we can sort of put you on a flexible sort of work style or schedule. Um, and I think also just like, yeah, um, making sure that your, your team is set up for success. You know, sometimes people might think customer service is not, you know, rocket science or anything. And while it might not be, there are a lot of things that customer service reps deal with that would be really, really hard for other people to deal with, you know, talking to difficult people, um, you know, having to keep up a positive attitude while you're handling people's problems for long periods of the day. Um, so just being mindful of that and giving people tools because people might be really great in being really efficient and they might need a little bit of um, shoring up in you know, how they're, they're communicating, just things like that. And so making sure that they are set up for success with every piece of criteria that you want them to employ. Don't think that they should just have it. Make sure that that's part of your training process and part of the like way you positive, positively reinforce it in your culture. That's fantastic uh, guidance. Um, one thing I'll, um, I'll leave our audience with um uh, is um, if you go to the cxandcultureconnection.com site, you can see the culture flywheel. My book's organized an acronym for C-U-L-T-U-R-E of creating an emotionally engaging experience and understanding your culture all the way to expanding your cultural movement, like the C through E. And you can see on the flywheel on the screen. So if you wanted to reach out and have a conversation, if you're another emerging brand, about how this methodology, the culture methodology, can help you to hyperscale in a way that you're thinking about your CX. A lot of the things that Femi is talking about um, are really good practices, and this methodology is to help you amplify and get even more of value out of considering these practices and engaging your team on your own journey. So would welcome those, those conversations. And, and uh, uh, Femi, if they wanted to reach out to you, uh, to continue the conversation is LinkedIn the best way for them to get in touch with you? LinkedIn's one way. Um, I actually, like I mentioned in the TEDx talk, if you go to femitedtalk.com, you can go right to the TEDx talk on YouTube. And then also femiolasupo.com um, is where I'll have, uh, where you can reach me. That's fantastic. And, and you've actually been a certified life coach. So you're, you have a lot of credentials to give people <laughs> advice on things like this. It's true. Yeah. I got certified maybe like 10 years ago. I thought I was going in that direction, but uh, ended up not being, uh, I don't feel like I'm a fit for life coaching full time, but it's been an amazing tool, uh, you know, in leading people um, and helping to support my team. I'm sure that's had a huge impact on the way you show up and the leadership you show and you're sensitive to how employee experience and culture and customer experience go together. So I think it's an amazing background and it shines through in the way you've, you've shared your thoughts in our conversation. I really know you've sparked some great ideas for me and I know you likely have for the audience. So thank you for your time today and really looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation more in the future, Remy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a joy. 